when you learn the Greek, one of the things you learn in the New Testament is that Paul, he gives a lot of commands like be patient and you know be generous, be gracious. And we always think, okay, I got to work on that. But really, he's always talking to us as a group. He's almost always talking in the second person plural. So he's always saying, you all take care of you all. Like it is community. Part of the gospel is being reflected in how we love and care for each other. It's how well we love each other. That's really where the rubber meets the road, right? You are listening to the Christian Music Archive podcast, part of the New Release Today podcast network. I'm your host, Dave Maurer. Each week, I share stories about Christ, community, and music, chatting with musical guests who you will find listed on the pages of the Christian Music Archive. There are thousands of creative men and women who have helped shape the soundtrack of the Christian faith, and we get to hear their stories, learn about how Christ has made a difference in their life, and hopefully along the way, we'll learn how we can be a better part of our community. Welcome to episode 53 of the podcast. For you math and calendar experts out there, you'll recognize that this episode marks our first birthday. It's been a pleasure sharing these weekly conversations with you, and I hope you found them entertaining and encouraging. For me, it's been so much fun to connect with each of these artists and hear how God is alive and working today. For the first episode of year number two, I'm going to share a great conversation I had with Ginny Owens. But before we get started, I thought it would be fun to do a quick review of where we've been in year one. We've heard a lot of great stories about music and the artists behind those songs. We've also got to meet several new friends, as well as connect with artists who I've admired for several years. But I think the thing I've appreciated the most is that we've been able to exchange ideas and insights about God's love. I've enjoyed looking at what community looks like. And for me, I've learned that community has less to do with my physical proximity to my neighbors and more about how I love those who I come in contact with. I've also appreciated the conversations about living intentionally with Christ. Together, we've heard stories about how God works in tough situations. We've heard how God transforms lives through the miraculous and the mundane. And for me personally, I've been challenged to dig deeper into learning how to be more deliberate and purposeful in recognizing my role with God on a day-by-day or even moment-by-moment basis. Hopefully this podcast is encouraging you to grow deeper in your relationship with Christ and with others as well. I recapped this last year because I want to let you know that the format of the podcast for year number two is going to be more of the same. So I'm honored to have you join me in these exchanges, and I hope you'll share these episodes with your friends and family. Sure, it would be fun to have a lot more downloads each week, but ultimately, I hope and pray that God is speaking to us through our shared interest in music. As a regular listener, you know that I am very passionate about the work of Mercy, Inc. Mercy is a Christian humanitarian group that works around the world to change the lives of people from a wide range of backgrounds. Today, I'd like to share with you about Bethesda Medical Clinic in Haiti. Dr. Rodney and his staff provide a wide range of medical treatments to those living in Cap Haitian, Haiti. But one of the key elements of their work is making sure that the patient's spiritual health is addressed as well. I've been to Bethesda a couple of times and have seen firsthand as the staff prays with their patients every day. Patients come to the clinic early each day to share in Bible study and prayer. Then they are treated for HIV and malaria. There are baby and mama wellness checks. Patients are treated for broken bones and are provided physical therapy. I'd love for you to get involved in the great work that Mercy Inc. is doing in Haiti through Bethesda Medical Clinic. Head over to christianmusicarchive.com mercy to learn about how you can make a difference in the hearts and physical bodies of the people of Haiti. That's christianmusicarchive.com mercy. And thanks in advance for your help. To start our second year of the podcast, I'm excited to welcome Ginny Owens to the conversation. I first became aware of Ginny in 1999 when she released her debut album, Without Condition. The Gospel Music Association then recognized Ginny in the year 2000 as the new artist of the year, and she's gone on to win three other Dove Awards since then. 
She's released 18 albums and has made a lot of tours all the way across the country. But her music is just a tiny part of who she is. She is currently wrapping up a master's degree in biblical studies and is the author of several books, including her newest one, Singing in the Dark, Finding Hope in the Songs of Scripture. In addition, Ginny has an amazing heart for living in community, and I appreciate her insights around what it looks like to be a Jesus follower. So it is with great honor that I introduce to you Ginny Owens. Welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you for having me, Dave. Great to chat with you today. Yeah, so we're talking to you all the way in New York City. That's right, all the way. And you've got a lot of stuff to talk about because you've been involved finishing up seminary, Yep. As you've just written a book, you've recorded a new album, you've got the new Faithful Project. Uh, so I guess my first question to you is, uh, are you getting any sleep? No, actually. <laughs> uh, one of the things that's going on this year is I can't sleep. It's really crazy. I don't know if it's all the stress or just my loud neighbors, but I uh, I keep trying to get sleep and I'm not getting any. So you guys can pray for me to get some sleep, like some supernatural sleep. It's pretty hard to, to do all this stuff when your brain is at half mast. So Could some of this stuff be keeping you up at night and so that you're working on this at night probably? <laughs> uh, it, well, it could, but no, I really do try to go to bed. and I th But I could be thinking about it at night. That that might be part of it. Who knows? Who knows what's going on? But but yeah, it's a lot of fun. I'm, I'm really excited about all the things. Very cool. Well, hopefully we can touch on a lot of those. I, I'd like to start though, because uh, for my job, and then also my daughter graduated from Columbia University, and I know you oh, attended okay, there. Cool. Yeah. I visited New York a couple, three times, and yeah. it's just, you know, living with 8.4 million of your closest friends uh, doesn't <laughs> sound like fun. So what draws you, what makes you love New York? Well, you know, I love the fact that uh, when you go out your door, you never quite know what's going to happen. <laughs> and uh, you, there are so many people around that, you know, for me as a person who can't see, I love just being able to navigate uh, wherever I want to go and be able to walk and do all my errands. I walked around the corner this morning and got my hair cut and then I realized I need to walk around the other corner and go to the pharmacy <laughs> later today. So I just love being able to do that. And I do find that some many of these 8.4 million people are just super friendly. And so uh, getting help with things is really easy if you if there's a strange construction site or mm. uh, something like that. So um, I really I really enjoy it. I think also, you know, growing up um, and, and then living in Nashville, um, you know, everywhere I've been, you always are in a car. And so mm. now in a sense, I get to see the world around me because there's there's noise and chatter and sounds and smells and all the things. So you get to experience those. So it's, I, I really find it a lot of fun. One of the things my daughter said was that, you know, everything, like you said, is just right around the corner. Yes. It's yeah. not like it's you have to so drive across convenient. town to get, you know, your your hair done because it's just right around the corner. It's just right around the corner. The only challenge is, of course, if it rains, then everyone wants to stay inside because it's, <laughs> yeah, you're like, I don't want to go get drenched. So it does have its disadvantages, but for the most part, it's that right around the corner thing is just wonderful. So you moved to New York specifically for seminary? Well, no, I, that was part of it, but I really moved to New York to move to New York. I've oh, always wow. loved New York ever since uh, I first went on the road. One of the first places that we came was to the Lambs Theater oh, sure. in New York. Yeah, where they used to have Live from the Lambs. And yeah. I was like, what is this place? I love it. I want more of it. So I um, fell in love with New York. Um and way back then, and then just have always kind of thought, I don't know, maybe I'll live there one day. And here we are. So it just uh, all the doors kind of opened for um, me to move. And uh, yeah, it's just absolutely, absolutely exciting. So you you said you came up from Nashville. And I know from hearing other uh, conversations that you had, you moved to Nashville because of your music. Well, I moved to Nashville to go to college. Yeah. So I had a, I was planning to go to a school in Jackson, Mississippi, where I grew up. Okay. I was working on taking out some student loans. And then I um, decided to move to Nashville because I got an almost full scholarship to Belmont University. Mm. And uh, I really thought I was going to major in something like 
psychology or religion. I kind of thought I'm not going to major in music. And I think for about a week, that was how it went. And then I was a music <laughs> major, just couldn't stay away. So. so the interest in religion has been there longer than your your recent stint in seminary then? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. I've always kind of thought that there'd be a day for seminary. In fact, I even started to take some seminary classes back when I first went on the road and it was just too much to handle. So, mm. uh, but, but yes, I, I definitely have, uh, always wanted to do that. So obviously we know of you because of your music and I'm always interested in how, how did your music passion start? How did you decide, no, oh, this might be something after a week of religion classes that I want to do? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've always loved music since I was a little kid. I've been playing the piano and singing, uh, albeit, you know, I was a pretty shy kid, but I still would spend a lot of time playing music. And I started writing when I was about seven so um, it was always kind of in my bones. And when I went to college, um, you know, I kind of met a lot of other strange music nerds like me. And I was like, this is amazing. And I, I fell in love with Nashville because it just had that music energy. And mm. yeah, I just was like, these are my people. And so, yeah, I think just because of kind of making some friends that were in music and just really loving music most, more than everything else, it just moved me to to decide to major in it. And then after college, I um, I really planned to be a high school music teacher. I thought that okay. would probably be the easiest thing to do. <laughs> and, uh, you know, like a little bit more, I don't know, like a, of a reliable job than say, uh, <laughs> you know, trying to make, make a career out of music. And yeah. I always tell people I'm probably one of the only people in Nashville that was desperately seeking a teaching job and ended up with a record deal instead. How did that happen? <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Um, well, the short version is um, I was asked to sing in church one day, I think pretty near the end of my last semester when I was student teaching. And I sang a song I had written and there was a guy in the congregation who was a, a studio engineer. Mm. And he asked me if I'd ever thought of doing music for a living. And I was like, well, kind of, but everybody else wants to. And I don't know if I'm good enough. And he's like, well, I don't know for sure either, but we should at least record some of your songs and mm. see. Yeah. So then he we recorded just some piano vocal demos and he passed those around to different friends of his in the business. And so every few months I would kind of hear from, well, it felt like that it was probably every few weeks. He'd be like, nothing yet. Um, and maybe about six or eight months later, he uh, he sent me an email and said, hey, I have a friend that um, is a music publisher and he mm. wants to meet with you. And so I met with Michael and he and I began working together. And he is the one who introduced me to Michael W. Smith okay. and took me over there to Rocket Town Records where I ended up. But, um, but yeah, it was kind of one of those things that felt like it took forever and really didn't at all. It was very quick. <laughs> well, hind all. hindsight, right? <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. So, so you were songwriter as a job first. Yes. And then the singing kind of came after it. Do you have a preference? Oh, they work different sides of the brain, I think. Uh, I probably, songwriting is a little harder, you know, in mm. some ways, because you got to sit and think about stuff and keep thinking on it and just wait till the lyrics are right. Uh, you know, but um, I, yeah, I guess they both have their, their challenges, but they both have their, uh, rewards as well. So it's hard to, might be hard to choose. Well, and, and then for you to get a recording contract with none other than Michael W. Smith, I mean, that's like, that's a dream, isn't it? It was pretty amazing. I remember my, uh, Michael Perrier, my publisher, picking me up from work and saying, um, Hey, we're just going to go and meet the folks at Rocket Town. He didn't tell me Michael was going to be mm. there. And Rocket Town at the time was in this little old house in Franklin, downtown Franklin. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember that day I had jumped out of bed. I can't even remember why, but I had jumped out of bed and threw on clothes and hadn't washed my hair or anything <laughs> before heading to work. So I was like, oh, man, just going to meet Michael with not clean hair. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that's uh, and then he was there and he was like, hi, I'm Michael Smith. And I was like, whoa. What is happening right now? You mean that Michael Smith? Yeah. Yeah, that Michael Smith. So yeah, it was it was terrifying and great. He's he's a lovely person. So. Well, well, one of the things I've often wondered because I loved the Rocket Town label and had kind of that indie songwriter vibe. How yeah. much did Michael Michael W. Smith uh, play into what you wrote and produced and and released? Was that all under his kind of guideship, or was he kind of saying 
you go and I'll support. Yeah, he was more kind of saying, you go and I'll support. Um, Don Donahue was the president in the A&R, so Don would speak into it a, a good bit more, but Michael always was so encouraging. He was a great cheerleader and champion for us. Um, so yeah, he was always kind of in the background, mm. but but mostly the day-to-day -day of, of deciding on songs um, was was done kind of in the house, and then he would he would ultimately get a say. You know, he would listen through and tell us what songs he liked best, et cetera, et cetera. Had you, like a lot of kids my age, kind of looked up to Michael as as oh my gosh, this guy's amazing and songwriters to start with? Yeah, I mean, definitely, like songs like Friends yeah. and and even Rocket Town. I I was not a, the biggest Christian music not to say fan, but I just didn't know. I wasn't very well acquainted with all of it. So I did like Michael. Um, I loved Amy. Um, she was very just, uh, her music was very f formative for me as a kid. So yeah, I mean, it, on some level, yes, it, it was hugely like, wow, this is phenomenal. I can't believe I get to be in the same room with this person, but probably not as much as some other people might have been just because I, I wasn't quite as familiar sure. with with all the ins and outs of Christian music as everyone else was. So when you came to Nashville, was it to do Christian music or was it just to, I mean, no, you came to school, I know, but I mean, yeah. what, was Christian, was the Christian component always part of it or was that just kind of an outgrowth of your relationship with Jesus? Yeah, I think it was kind of an outgrowth. I, I just, yeah, I really didn't know. I didn't have a plan for, you know, getting into Christian music. I mean, I think a lot of the stuff I wrote was Christian, but I also always had a heart for sharing music and sharing with people that didn't hold my views and, mm -hmm. you know, using using music as a place to um, kind of share honestly about my faith. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, I think it just kind of naturally happened, but was not planned. Well, I'm always interested in people's journey through faith because I think we all grow hearing other people's yeah. testimonies. Sure. Tell me, tell me about how you became a personal relationship with Jesus, not what mom and dad said. Well, I actually came to faith very early on in life. I was four when I asked Jesus into my heart at Bible school, vacation Bible school. Uh -huh. And, um, but I think just, you know, you don't really understand grace and faith when you're that young, but I did believe that Jesus was with me. And, um, it was, gosh, I would say, well, I, I just remember different times in life when when the Lord has really made himself real to me. I remember uh, one time just in middle school going through lots of different bullying and just really dark days as, as we often do in mm -hmm. middle school. And I remember my mom saying to me one day, you know, Jenny, Jesus is always your best friend, but there are going to be some days when he's your only friend. And you can trust him, you know, because he's been through that worst darkness because he loves you that much. So you can tell him everything. And of course, as a as a middle schooler, I was like, great, whatever. <laughs> yeah, um, but I right. think now I can, you know, I, I look back on that and it, it, that word really reverberates in my mind of just God's faithfulness. And there have been some other times when, you know, I've kind of made some other choices and and said, you know, well, maybe I'll I'll kind of take my life plan into my own hands. Mm -hmm. And again and again, the Lord really uh, brings me back to him and challenges me to um, to kind of listen, you know, and it's usually mm -hmm. by by bringing lots of challenges, bringing lots of hard times, um, but nothing like hard times to wake you up to the truth. You said you wanted to use your music to share with others about your faith. How did that kind of transpire as as you said you were writing songs very, very early in, in your mm -hmm. high school and early college before you were in the biz? <laughs> right. How did that how did that look? Uh, you know, I just it's hard to say. I think I would just sit down and write about whatever was going on in my life. Mm. So sometimes that I mean, it was always my way of journaling. I would just, you know, when everyone was out of the house, I would sit at the piano and journal my way through thoughts and feelings and, you know, basically just write songs. Uh -huh. um, but a lot of times songs were the conversations that I wasn't brave enough to have with people. Uh -huh. So a lot of times I would sort out what I would like to tell them, you know, the hope that I would love to offer them. And sometimes that would give me the courage to actually, you know, go and talk to them and, you know, talk about it, uh, talk about my faith more openly. But um, yeah, I always felt like songwriting was a space to do that, was a space to just be 
um, be maybe more honest than I ever felt like I could be in day to day conversation. So that's kind of how it started. And I think from there, you know, I still think about, um, you know, people that I talk to people that I interact with on, on social media or email list, and just think about, okay, what is it that they're going through? Mm. Uh, what, it, what are the stories that I hear? And a lot of those stories end up in, uh, in my songs, you know, just, mm. just thinking about how, how do I encourage them in this very dark place where they are? For me, I've always struggled with being able to share my faith with people as I, you know, just in day-to-day relationships. And I kind of wish sometimes I had the songwriting ability where I could say, well, here's what I would tell you if I could figure out how to tell you. <laughs> and and definitely there's something to that. I feel like one of the, the beautiful things that you start to learn in seminary, well, you don't have to learn it in seminary, you can learn it anywhere. <laughs> but one of the things I've, 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 really learned so much is how we live out our faith and we pray for the Holy Spirit to give us opportunities. Mm -hmm. And then we take those opportunities to kind of speak up. So I I feel like I'm learning slowly that, you know, that dialogue um, is possible, Mm. uh, whether you write songs or not, but, but it's partly just about intentionally living with people and valuing who they are and enough that you, that you want to tell them uh, the good news that, you know, so, so I, I definitely feel like, oh, okay. I, I, I don't have to think of it as pressure to evangelize. I have right. to think of it as I love this person so much that I don't want them to miss out on this great truth that I know. So, so what I hear you're saying is you're developing relationships with people so that they can speak their need to you and you to them, vice versa. And then you can share out of the experiences of of your faith, how you've gone through those needs? Is that a fair Well, I th- sure, yeah. I mean, I think it's just developing friendships too. Right. I think it's just in friendship, we learn about each other, right? And when you're a creative, you usually express what you're learning about other people and what you're learning about yourself mm-hmm. in some form. So whether that's songwriting or art or whatever it is you do, um, yeah, I think, I think you definitely, you know, it's definitely a um, just kind of a natural part of being creative is that whatever's going on in your in your life and in your friendships, it kind of flows out into your into your art. That's a good reminder because a lot of times I think when I think of evangelism, I think of Billy Graham or Louise Palau or you know yeah. speaking to thousands and thousands and of unchurched people and winning them. But what we're talking about is a one on one friendship. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. these days I think one-on-one friendship is where it begins. It's no, we can no longer just bring people to a service and hope that they hear things that make sense to them mm-hmm. because now, I mean, even more than far more than when Billy Graham was alive, you know, a lot of what we hold to in the Christian space does not make sense. It's very foreign yeah. to our friends and neighbors. And so we, we need to understand that ourselves and understand why it is and how and so that Mm -hmm. we can explain it to them when we when we do get the opportunity to share the gospel so i i think that's one thing i've started to do too is to um kind of write out things that i would say Mm -hmm. about sharing my faith like how do i talk about how do i talk about jesus you know Mm -hmm. what is my experience with him that i would want to tell people and what is the experience that i believe they could have with him and honestly, I think writing those things out is so helpful because then it gives us a place to go when we're in those conversations. We're not going to get it all all right all the time, right. but it's so important to be able to articulate. I mean, that's what like, you know, Peter doesn't say, oh, well, you have to just go out and t-. I mean, you know, of course, I think some people are just natural evangelizers. They just go out and talk right. you know, to somebody for 30 seconds and then they're sharing the gospel. (laughs) Maybe all of us don't start that quickly, but he does say, you know, be able to give a reason, an answer Mm. for the hope that you have. And so we all at least can be responsible enough to do that. And what is our answer? What is it? And that's really been uh, a challenge to me to just think about that and uh, learn how to, you know, and as a creative that changes from day to day, (laughs) like how you would express that. But I have, have started to feel like, wow, it's really important for me to know what to say. What I'm hearing you say is, um, and my piano teacher told me this, is practice, practice, practice. Yes, practice. And I'd yeah. never thought of if, if, of sharing your faith as something that we have to practice to, oh, yeah. to be prepared for. That's a great thought. Absolutely. Especially, I mean, and I think one of the things that can help us doing that is 
coming home and thinking about something we've heard or thinking about something we've read on social media that we don't agree with mm -hmm. and thinking about why and thinking about what the argument against it, like if you are going to lovingly put an argument back t toward whoever said, you know, this thing, mm -hmm. what would it mean? You know, or, or even it's maybe reading, reading people you wouldn't agree with that have a, maybe an atheist, hmm. atheistic view of the world and, and thinking about starting to answer their questions in your quiet time, like starting yeah. to answer your questions, their questions when you're alone. Um, because I do think it's, it's when we're doing that, that we actually, uh, kind of start to work out these matters for ourselves. Yeah. And, and so then we can say more than, no, -uh, you're wrong. <laughs> right. Well, and I never thought of that, that verse that you said, you know, be prepared to, to share your faith as there is preparation and right. other, aside from just being, you know, going to church and taking communion, but yeah. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. There's ways to get prepared. Just like we have to practice for concerts. We have mm -hmm. to practice for telling our, our story of faith. Yeah. Well, you've alluded a little bit to this, this past, well, we've always, I always tie it to the past year with the pandemic, but it was kind of happening before that kind of the darkness mm -hmm. that we're experiencing in our world, the antagonism and so forth. And your new book is called Singing in the Dark, Finding Hope in Songs of and Scriptures. Yeah. How has that topic become so prevalent in your mind that you wanted to write a book about? Well, I think we all live in some level of darkness, whether that darkness is just sheerly the lack of clarity that we have because we can't sit across from God and have a chat with him, right. you know? Mm -hmm. So there is some level of cluelessness to to our lives even <laughs> if we think we have control it's like i don't know what's going to happen tomorrow mm -hmm. but but for some of us even there's darkness that is you know a disability perhaps that you're always living with or which doesn't i mean if you live with it you don't worry too much about it but there mm -hmm. are certainly challenges or maybe it's a chronic condition chronic health condition or um maybe just difficult circumstances in your in your personal journey and so how do we get through that darkness? And I feel like, especially in these days and times, you know, we kind of know God is there, you know, we have a sense of that, but what does that actually mean? Yeah. Like, how does that help us? How does that change us? And I think the other thing that we all, for the most part, are acquainted with uh, is uh, not only darkness, but but music. And whether we can carry a tune or not, we <laughs> love song and yeah. we love, you know, what it does for us. It, it moves us. It makes our bodies move to yeah. the rhythm. You know, it makes our minds uh, kind of reverberate with the lyrics and then we sing along, you know, so we're fully engaged. And in fact, the Bible tells us to sing. It doesn't invite us to sing. It like commands us to hmm. sing. It doesn't say if you can carry a tune, sing. Hmm. So whether it's literal singing or just your heart and your mind singing the truth, um, I wanted to write about what I've been learning about how God's song throughout scripture, when that song is on repeat in our minds, it just changes the way that we handle everything. And it changes how we look at the darkness. It certainly changes how we can face it, our attitude towards it. Um, and so in, in the book, I go through 10 different songs from scripture. They're not all literal songs. Some of them are prayers. Um, they're, they're kind of different, different things, but I look at those songs and talk about, you know, how did these bring hope uh, to mm -hmm. whatever darkness we're facing. And uh, we there's even a spot at the end of each chapter to uh, write your own song or your mm -hmm. own heart response. It doesn't have to be a literal song again, but just the, your heart response to what you're reading. Um, so yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. I also tell a lot of my own story, which sometimes is harder to, to share than <laughs> other times, but just, yeah. you know, how I have, um, how I've looked for for hope in all the wrong places and um, many seasons of life and how the Lord continues to teach me to sing uh, yeah. a new song. Do you know who Tim Timmons is and his 10,000 minutes? I've been, yeah. I've been enjoying his podcast lately, but the whole thing of, of the change of perspective kind of, as you're talking about of the worship singing of the prayers that can change from the inside out your, your viewpoint on, on issues and mm -hmm. and that that's a very intriguing thing you know you've done a lot of of worship leading has that worship leading been part of this attitude and shift for you well probably a little bit of both yeah i think part of it has been living my own 
experiences, but also engaging with lots of people and hearing their stories and experiences and seeing how how similar we all are in so many ways. Um, so I think there's, you know, definitely I've I've just learned we all kind of struggle with a lot of the same things, <laughs> yeah. no matter where we are in in life. And and we really all kind of struggle with, you know, how do we practically apply what the Lord is teaching us about himself to our lives? Like yeah. how does that become real to us? And so whether I'm leading worship or writing songs for, you know, the next project or writing a book, I'm always thinking about that. And like, how do we, how do we, how do, how do I help paint a picture of who God is for us? Like, how do I help inspire mm -hmm. people to want to know who God is? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you talk about using your writing. You've also worked on another project that has been very intriguing to me, the Faithful Project. Yeah. And and this is taking a look at scripture in maybe a little different angle than we're used to and pulling that into music. You want to talk a little bit about that project? Yeah, so Faithful was a gathering of a lot of women authors and artists that um we came together to uh get to know each other, to write songs, and we even wrote a book together. And we explored various women in the Old and New Testament and we tell their stories and you know, we we actually sat together a lot and uh, as we were writing the songs, and we we went through their stories and we were you know always moved to find how their stories were not unlike ours. Hmm. There was always something we could relate to, always an element of you know joy or sorrow in mm -hmm. their stories that also is very much like our lives today, and uh, and especially then the way God worked in their stories and how He used them and um, how He uses us. So making those parallels and and really finding hope in those songs was uh, was really really special um and just the collaboration um, everybody from like amy grant to ellie holcomb mm. to um gosh all kinds of uh sally lloyd jones um and voss camp all kinds of different folks were involved so it was a really really special project uh there's something about thinking together you know mm -hmm. like studying the scriptures together and thinking about you know, wow, how is Leah's story like mine? You know, mm. I've never really taken time to think about that. You know, so we think of those things and we kind of put ourselves in their, you know, in their place as we are writing songs about them. And uh, it, yeah, it was, it was really, really cool to get to do that together. Well, and one of the things that this drew out to me, in fact, we were talking about this in a Bible study that I'm part of, is how a lot of the stories in the Bible, uh, we were talking about Ruth and Boaz and Naomi at the time, um, these are just normal people doing normal stuff. Uh -huh. And yep. I think it's interesting okay. that we probably have, as the, the scriptures were canonized or whatever you call it, that they became, you know, the official book of the Bible. These must be huge saints of, you know, no, they were just normal people like you and me. Right. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. It's important to remember that. I think it helps us when we're reading the Bible too, to think not only did God use these lives and the lives of the people around them, mm -hmm. But he knew he he's not he was not confused about this. He knew that those lives would be speaking to us all these thousands of years later. Yeah. So when we go to our Bibles, we get to ask, okay, what is it that God is showing us about our own time and our own lives um, through these lives that that were you know from so long ago? Yeah. And then how can we be that chapter in somebody's life that we're in relationship with? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about your just wrapping up, or have you finished seminary? Uh, I am still in the thick of the last year, so I okay. still have quite a few classes to go, about three or four more. So you're getting a master's in biblical studies, right? Yes, that is correct. Now, whenever I hear somebody say musician and master of biblical studies, I immediately think of people like Michael Card or... Oh, yeah. You know, I love Michael. People, yeah. people who are able to pull things out, kind of like you were saying, out of scripture and make them more accessible, I yes. guess. So yeah. is, is your is your MBS study, was that to enhance your music skills or was that something else? Yeah, uh, always to do that. Always want to write better songs, especially when I'm writing for the church. Mm -hmm. um, well, I always want to write, write better songs anyway, but <laughs> I, I do think that, you know, uh, studying the Bible more thoroughly helps me to write better songs and especially better songs about, uh, about faith. 
and um and then also just really wanting to write more and maybe write more studies mm. uh write more you know books and and kind of follow the michael card path i mm. i really i i'm huge admirer of michael so i um i learn a lot from him he's a he's a personal friend and mentor oh, very to me cool. so yeah. So what would you say up to this point, because you're not quite done yet, what is your biggest takeaway from, from your seminary studies so far, Ben? Oh, man. I think one of them is we just can never entirely grasp all of the beautiful, powerful concepts of God's love in mm. the Bible that he wants to give us, to show us. Um Gosh, there's so many things. One of the things that's been really fun, learning the languages, you, you kind of see things differently. Mm. Um, like for instance, when you learn the Greek, one of the things you learn in the New Testament is that Paul, you know, like he gives a lot of commands, like be patient and, you know, be generous, yeah. be gracious. And we always think, okay, I got to work on that. But really he's always talking to us as a group. He's always, almost always talking in the second pl person plural. So he's mm. always saying, you all, take care of you all like mm. it is community i mean the part of the gospel is being reflected in how we love and care for each other it's not just what we do on our own time you know in mm. our own space mm -hmm. but it's how well we love each other that's really where the rubber meets the road right yeah. and so i think concepts like that have really come alive uh to me and just i've just been like whoa this is this is really <laughs> cool um, so yeah, there, I could go on all day, but, but those are a couple of my favorites. Just, just kind of learning how the languages help us see, see the Bible. But, but even, I mean, even we don't even need the languages. I mean, somebody needs the languages, but we don't all have to know the languages to yeah. see the beauty and the color in the Bible. But I think just to remember that, um, the more we linger with it, the more we spend time in its pages, the more it's going to speak to us. Yeah. And I think I've, I've really seen that to be true, uh, which has been very, very special. You've said a couple of things now, both in your the writing that you did in the Bible study around the faithful project of being in community, and then of, of Peter's export, exportation to, hey, y'all, take care of y'all, um, yeah. the whole community piece. And that's when I first started this podcast, that was a desperate cry of my heart, is that I felt like we as a society have lost that community. We and, have. And yeah. how do we... How do we encourage that to develop again you know well I th yeah that's a great question i think we have to make a determination a determined decision that we're going to go and be community and i feel like mm. i kind of think it means adopting the people around us as mm. our community and being very intentional about loving them whether they respond or not and kind of knowing that I, I think they will because i think people really love community eventually mm -hmm. yeah but we're always so busy. I think what has happened is our priorities are just off. Like we like community, but we kind of think we're getting it from Facebook, even though we're <laughs> absolutely not. Right. <laughs> um, but I do think that just continuing to be consistently in people's lives, even when it's hard to show up. And uh, as we were talking about earlier, I think this is where the spirit really can speak to us about you know, how to be in people's lives, whose lives to be in, but it's usually the hard thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> do the next thing with people and and it's probably a hard thing, you know, uh, just to, to sort of be in those spaces with people and um, continuing to love them. But I really have to think of it almost as um, adopting people, you know, adopting my church family, huh. you know, almost like instead of worrying so much about, oh, are they going to be friends with me? I just say, you know, this is my community or these are the people around me. I'm going to love them and I'm going to serve them and yeah. I'm going to trust God to work in the midst of those relationships. So I think that's where we all get to start. Um, we just, and more than being kind of like, a, you got to go out and do this. You know, what we get to be moved by is how Jesus has done that for us mm. and how he has come after us and continues to pursue us. So of course we want to we want to respond by by loving, like yeah. radiate that love to other people. Yeah. Well, I was wondering, would you be willing to give an example of where you intentionally adopted, like you said, community, and that was beneficial? And then also maybe a description of when you re were on the receiving end of that. Yeah, I think they're kind of both in the same. I think... Uh, as a person who can't see, the church can be a very, very lonely place because the church does not do well with people that are different. 
It mm. just doesn't. It's not, uh, it's, it's getting better. But I mean, I think that's a lot of the conversation we're hearing right now is church just is kind of like, if you don't, if you're not like me completely, I don't, I don't know what to do with you. Mm. And um, I've been so blessed to get to travel around, you know, the country and the world and, and meet people from yeah. different churches who wanted to talk to me. And so that I think has kept me having a, a hopeful <laughs> heart toward church, just being able to engage with so many brothers and sisters in Christ and loving that experience. But um, I would say at home, it's always been a, a deeply sad experience just because, you you know, I can go in church and not be spoken to and leave and not find anyone to talk to. And um, so the way that I used to handle that, especially when I was on the road a lot, I was like, this is so exhausting. Either mm. people knew my music and they came up and were just like, I didn't know them. And they yeah. grabbed me for a hug and just want to talk yeah. about everything. Or they just were didn't know me and were super awkward. And I was like, oh, this is just, I don't like church. <laughs> so what I would do was just get there right before the service started or maybe late <laughs> and leave <laughs> early. Mm -hmm. And um, the problem with that was I was not helping the situation. I was not helping mm. anyone change. And I was just getting harder hearted. And oh. that, that wasn't cool because that also assumes that I've never, you know, uh, dismissed somebody or mm. been shy around somebody, you know, it's sort of making me out to be perfect. And I'm not that. So I think one of the things that began to change is I really discovered, you know, even Paul's view of, of community over the last, you know, many years is just, um, just the value of being in each other's space. Like we, we just were called to it. Mm -hmm. We don't actually get you know, it's not like uh, if you want to be kind to these people, no way mm. we are. We are called to this. So when I moved to New York, I just decided that I was going to just show up and get involved because I knew that I needed church mm -hmm. um, as, you know, as much as it needed me because uh, mm. it needed some differentness in its space. And uh, and my church is wonderful. The staff especially have been uh, just always so kind and caring to me. And, um, and I've begun to get to know people like I I'm a co-leader, uh, in a community group and have made some, uh, good friends, uh, in that group, but there are still a lot of Sundays when it's hard. If, if yeah. people aren't there that I know, there are a lot of people that are just terrified because, you know, I don't know, maybe yeah. I will beat them with my stick. They, they're just, <laughs> they don't know. So I think just, um, and yet, uh, it's been a, it's been a wonderful, uh, space for growth for me and just for connection and community. We have a, a morning prayer group that started meeting during the pandemic and we still meet every, every day of six mm. days a week mm -hmm. uh, for 30 minutes and pray. And just to be part of that has been very sweet. And, you know, I think again, you just keep pursuing because you know that, that I know that Jesus is with me, even when that pursuit right. is hard. And I know that, that God has pursued me. So I can't, I can't not do this. So yeah, that would be a really tangible example of just showing up and continuing to do it, even when it feels a little awkward. And usually I find that um, God will bless me with someone to sit with and yeah. it'll be, it's great. So uh, we started attending a new church because we moved and I had the experience of feeling like I was the only person in the corner that nobody would come talk to and you know, and it wasn't until I actually said, okay, I'm going to step out and try to start shaking some hands that all of a sudden... I started developing friendships so that I had that relationship to to greet me when I came in the door. Exactly. What do you yeah. what do you tell the person who is an introvert? I mean, you mentioned earlier yes, you were kind of introverted. Yes. Um, how do you break out of that comfort of the unknown? I mean, I I'm not leaning on your blindness, but you can't even see the unknown. So that probably makes it even worse. How do you break out of that and say I'm going to do it anyway. Well, I think you, you can start by smiling at people because, you know, most of the folks listening probably can see them. Mm -hmm. um, be, become a greeter, you know? I mm. mean, that'll, that'll knock it right out of you. Volunteer <laughs> to be a greeter, you know? <laughs> As um, an introvert, I don't see many people jump into that opportunity. I though. <laughs> know, but you know, I mean, you're never, you're probably not going to do it alone. And all you have to do is say hi and smile and maybe direct folks to a seat. I don't know. But, mm -hmm. but like, Finding ways to involve yourself, I think, is, is first of all, or, or whatever you're interested in, get involved in that ministry. Yeah. Um, I think that's always a way to start, you know, you, you know, and pray about, you know, this is where 
the power of prayer is yes. is powerful. Yes. You know, you you can ask God what what part, what ministry should I get involved in? What next step should I take? But I think if you start moving forward, like you're saying about shaking people's hands, there will be momentum. And mm -hmm. um and there may be lonely days and it may take a while, but you will find your your people. Uh I, I do believe that that will happen. Yeah. So well, Judy, I am just uh, it's super honored to be able to chat with you and talk about what God's doing. What do you see the the remainder of 2021 for you? I mean, you've just finished a bunch of projects, so certainly you can take a break, right? <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. We might might put out a few more songs. We're always trying to put out new songs on Spotify and uh, Apple Music and all the places you get your music. So we may put out a few more songs before the end of the year, but... Um, yeah, now I just got to try to finish my classes so I can graduate yeah. and uh, <laughs> yeah, kind of get get all that done. And um, we're now that uh, things have opened back up some, we're starting to travel again, which is really fun. So, so yeah, lots of exciting stuff to come. Every Saturday we send out a prayer newsletter and I know you and I have communicated about that a couple of times. How yeah. can we specifically be praying for you in the weeks and months ahead? Well, you know, sleep actually would be a really great thing. It's <laughs> It's been several months of, of kind of very few hours of sleep a night, which I do not do well on. So I would love for the Lord to restore my sleep. Um, and then I think just clear vision for the next steps, you know, as I create new music and just as I write more, just, just clear vision that the Lord would show me exactly what that needs to be and where and how. Oh my goodness, there were so many rich nuggets in my conversation with Jenny today, weren't there? But there's a couple that really stand out in particular. One idea I hadn't really thought about before was how to share my faith. I, I've always struggled with telling people in person about my relationship with Jesus. Oh, sure, it's easy for me to chat with fellow believers about what God is doing, but to actually share my faith with someone who doesn't have a faith relationship with Jesus, that's been a challenge. Ginny encouraged us to actually write out what we might say in those situations, and then practice it. I think of standing in front of the mirror as a kid, preparing my speech for class. That practice made it easier for me to stand in front of my peers and to do my report. Or as musicians, we put in hours and hours of practice before performing our songs in public. So how is sharing my faith any different from that? I think I'm going to try to do just that, writing out what I'm going to say and practice what I'm going to share about my faith so that when the opportunity arises, I'm not fumbling for words. Of course, you can probably guess what the second part of our conversation was that really stands out. That's our talk about community. Ginny said something that I've been slowly becoming aware of over the past several months, and that is that the church today just does not do very well with people that are different. I've seen many examples of this recently, whether around handicap or skin color or political party or even the wearing of masks. It seems to me that the church is becoming more and more divisive, and I sure don't think that is what God intended. I think because the church has become so fractured and divisive that it's no wonder we aren't attracting non-believers to join us. I mean, who wants to spend a part of their weekend with people who are fighting and arguing with each other? As I dig deeper into scriptures and try to understand the heart of God, I am becoming more and more convinced that God does not really care about my bank account, my job, or even my health. I, I know that sounds pretty radical. But I think ultimately what God cares about is a relationship with me and a relationship with you. He died on the cross to remove the penalty of sin so that I could be friends with or even a child of God. His sacrificial death wasn't so I could have a better program at church or drive the latest car. When the stuff of life that we value so much, when that gets in the way of our relationships and in the way of community, well, that's the problem. I'm learning that if I really want to live like God and to be intentional about living with him, then I'm going to have to start focusing on what's important to him and not pushing my agenda or contradicting other people's ideologies. I need to start focusing on people's hearts. 
I think that for our churches to be effective, or dare I say for the body of Christ to be effective in reaching the lost, we'll have to make this change in our church heart as well. 2 Peter 3 verses 8 and 9 say it this way, But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you. And now here's the kicker. He's not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God wants a relationship with each of us. His promise is to be with us forever. And he is going to keep striving for us to be in a relationship with him, even if it takes him a thousand years. If that is God's focus, shouldn't I want that too? So how do I go about changing my life to reflect that change in focus? How does that change my relationship with the people around me? And how does that adjust my interaction with my community? I'd like to thank Ginny Owens for sharing these insights with us today. And to close out our time together, I thought I'd leave you with the latest song from Ginny's album. So here is Sing in the Darkness from Ginny's new album, Sing Hope in the Darkness. From the light of creation, your love on display. The power that authors every life now gives us faith. Though the path feels uncertain, Lord, you are the way. You'll strengthen our hearts until our eyes see face to face.
As always, thanks for joining me for this conversation today. I am grateful that we get to spend this time together each week hearing stories of God's amazing faithfulness. As a regular listener to this podcast, would you mind taking a few minutes and rating it on your favorite podcast app? Reviews and ratings really help spread the word so that other folks can hear about these great conversations. And if you have comments or questions for me, please feel free to drop me a message on any of the social media platforms. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Patreon by searching for at CCM Exchange. Or you can always drop me an email on the website, christianmusicarchive.com. I'm really looking forward to our time together next week when I have another great conversation with one of the musicians you'll find on the pages of the Christian Music Archive. So until then, remember this, God loves you. In fact, he's crazy about you. <laughs>